Well, we are going to be in John 12 today, and if you want to pull out a Bible or you'd like to uh, grab your iPhone or an iPad or whatever you might have, would invite you to do that. As we're doing that, the kids are going to head downstairs. They have children's church in our lower level, which is an age-appropriate message for them, for our younger kids, and they are welcome to go at this point. But we're going to be in John 12, and I'm going to tell the story a little bit differently. Um, you can follow along in the scripture today, and it's going to be kind of a narrative today. I'll interject a little bit here and there, but I'm going to basically tell you a story today uh, that you can follow along. John 12, 12 through 29 are the key verses as we talk about Palm Sunday. And one of the challenges, and I think every pastor has to figure out how to deal with this, um, I was lamenting this playfully this, earlier this week. How do you preach Palm Sunday and keep it interesting, right? You know, there's lots of holidays that you can pick other verses and you can move around and, and be creative, but there's not a whole lot of material for a Palm Sunday, right? I mean, it's, this is what you get, and so you got to work with it. And so you try to keep it interesting even as a pastor, otherwise I'd bore myself. So hopefully this turns out nicely. Hopefully you will enjoy it. I think you will. I'm happy with it anyhow. Well, how many of you have seen, and I think most of you have, but how many of you have seen, they used to do these a lot back in the olden days, the ticker tape parades in New York City, right? Where, where war hero, heroes would come back at the end of World War I, World War II, coming down the streets, right? And people would be just throwing rolls of paper and, and ticker tape from the old stock tickers, like confetti coming out of windows and just, you know, stuff blowing everywhere. There was this time then that, that our country honored heroes with this colossal spectacle, right? And, and the, the soldiers, or if it was a celebrity, they, they would ride in convertible automobiles right down these normally packed with cars, busy streets of New York City. And if you've never been in a big city, uh, Minneapolis isn't quite this way. I mean, sometimes you get a little bit of the feel, but if you go downtown Chicago or you get somewhere like downtown New York, where it almost feels like you're walking in a tunnel because the, the buildings just go so far up into the sky. They, they, they blot out the sun, right? It's, it's, it's dark down there. The sun rarely reaches the street because all these buildings, right? And then you got this confetti and, and this paper and these rolls of paper and, and, and it's just blowing everywhere. And it's just, it, if you've seen the video, I, I haven't experienced it firsthand, but if you've seen the video, it's beautiful. It looks like a marvelous, amazing, wonderful thing, right? And you, and you got the bands, okay? And, 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 and no good parade isn't led by a band playing something by Sousa, Right? You know who Sousa is, right? Yeah, you know those hymns, aren't hymns, those tunes. And, and so you got the bands marching, and you got young ladies with pom poms and their the, the batons, right? Twirling. I can't do that. It's like, bonk, right in the head. I just don't have that skill. But, but, you know, they're throwing them up in the air and confetti and streamers and balloons and just all of that's going on, right? Everybody was there. It's a time of great excitement, right? Well, did you know that Jesus was given a parade as well? Jesus was given a parade in Jerusalem. And, and, and at the time he was given his parade, there was a, a mass of humanity concentrated on the city of Jerusalem. Some estimates say at these times, as many as possibly two million people crushed in to Jerusalem, into these narrow streets of the holy city. They would crush into the city at the time of Passover for this ultimate of celebrations of Judaism. Now, imagine that day. And imagine you're in Jerusalem a couple thousand years ago. And you hear from the distance, right? A noise, kind of a, a rhythmic noise. Uh, a staccato chant of sorts begins to waft its way in. And slowly, but gradually, it gets louder and louder. And it sounds like it's coming from the southern gate of the city. And the people around you all of a sudden get hushed. They stop talking. They turn their face and their ears and they start listening as well, wondering, what is that? What are we hearing? And as people listen, 
they begin to hear this recurring word. Hosanna. 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 And as it approached, it it got louder and louder and and it became more and more of a chant. And as the progression of the procession comes and as the dust, you know, as the streets would have been back then, the dust would begin to rise as people were moving towards them from the shuffling of feet. Men and and women would begin to press in and shove in and and try to get closer to the street, right? And the hosannas keep getting louder and louder and louder, reverberating against the the stone walls and the stone buildings, right? Then a man comes running ahead of the procession. And he's saying something, and it's hard to hear him because you're straining to hear him over the shouts of hosanna. And and what he's yelling is, is Jesus of Nazareth is coming. The prophet is coming. The man who raises the dead is coming. Hurry, Jesus is coming. And so the crowd began to inch closer and closer to the street. You can, you, you can see dads, you know, picking up their little children, right? Keeping them safe. Sticking them up on their shoulders, right? I got a seven-year-old and he, Dad, I can't see, you know, he t- t- tugging on my, my leg. All right, buddy, pick him up. Get him up on my shoulders where he could see everything. Everyone wanted to catch a glimpse. Everyone wanted a, an unhindered, unencumbered view. Everyone wanted to see this strange prophet that they'd been hearing so much about. Now, what they saw was strange. Well, or at least unexpected. You see, Jesus, he moved serenely into town on the back of a, of a small donkey. Much like a man riding in a convertible in a parade. Jesus, the honored celebrity. He was the center of attention. The eye of the hurricane. Around him was all chaos, but in him was calmness. Rather than the sound of confetti and streamers ruffling through the air like you might think of in New York City. Instead, what you would have heard was the the slashing and the whooshing of palm branches as, as they were cut and being waved placed on the ground in front of the donkey's hooves. Other, other parade watchers that day, what they were doing was they were taking off their cloaks, their outer garments. They took off these coats, these cloaks, and they began to spread them on the ground before Jesus, much, much like a, a red carpet if you watch, you know, like the Emmys or any of those shows on television, right? And so they rule out the red carpet for Jesus. And the coats would have made a, a multicolored path for Jesus and his donkey to travel upon. It would have been an incredible scene. I would have loved to have been there. Loved to be part of that gala event, right? Though I wouldn't want to have been the street sweeper after it. But uh, all segments of humanity were present that day. They were there for that first Palm Sunday procession as Jesus came into Jerusalem. You know how I know? Well, we know by what's left on the streets. You can tell a lot about people by what they leave behind. The first group are innocent passerby people, right? The innocent passerbys, they'd never seen Jesus before and they didn't recognize him now necessarily. But they found themselves kind of caught up in the procession. Many of them would have been travelers, pilgrims, uh, coming into town for worship with their, with their burlap bags, and they're in Jerusalem simply to celebrate the Passover. Perhaps they had come out early that morning and planned a family outing. They were going to go up to the Mount of Olives and have a picnic or something, right? They knew nothing of what was to come that day. But they were in the right place at the right time. And they simply got caught up in this historical moment. Now, I know how they felt. I do. Have you ever been, coincidentally, at the right place at the right time? Right? Where you managed to to unexpectedly see something amazing? I've had that happen. One of those moments came about 10 years ago, give or take. Um, A co-worker of mine 
He was, he was brand new. He was a trainee. I had been training him in. And he was a new co-worker, and he had been given some tickets to a football game for his birthday from his brother. And this was a football game between the Minnesota Vikings and the San Diego Chargers. Well, see, he was new, and he had to work Sunday. I had worked there for a long time. I had seniority. I didn't have to work Sundays anymore. So he's complaining as I'm training him Saturday night about these tickets he's not going to be able to use the next day for the Vikings game. Well, what do you want for him? He said, oh, give me 40 apiece. And they were $60 tickets. So I was, all right. Pull out the money. Here you go, buddy. I'm going to the Vikings game, right? So we get there. I've been to Vikings games before, but we get there. I uh, take my wife and I, we go. And we get there and we get in just as kickoff is happening with no idea what's going to be accomplished that day. We get to our seats, we sit down, we enjoy the, the beginning of the game. And pretty soon it begins to seem obvious that this day is going to be a little bit different because they keep handing the ball to Adrian Peterson, right? And he starts breaking off chunks, 10, 18, 23, 45 yards. And the numbers begin to pile up. And when it's all said and done, Adrian Peterson sets the all-time rushing record for a single game with 296 yards. And I tell you what, he could have had 350 or 400 if he wanted that day. He was unstoppable. Never have I witnessed a man who just completely dominated in such fashion. It was a thing of beauty. The whole Metrodome, every, everybody in the, I mean, however many people the Metrodome holds, what is it, like 70,000 plus 55 guys on that team and 55 guys on this team, everybody knew who was getting the ball in every single play. Yet they couldn't stop him. It was amazing. And to think, I lucked into those tickets, right? A memory I'll have forever. And like us, in, in, in those amazing moments, those early vacationers in Jerusalem for Passover, they were just passerbys, right? They were innocent bystanders that got caught up in the moment. They hadn't planned to be part of this event. They just happened to be present when this parade comes rolling by. And like those of us who've been there for an amazing display... These people would have been glad that their paths had crossed Jesus' path. They, they were in awe of the majesty of the moment. It was more than just the crowds that were chanting and the chaos. It was the man at the center of it all. He was the Christ. And they see in Jesus this, this look of wonder, the countenance of compassion, the face of a friend. They would have been enthralled by his determined pace and his purposeful steps as he is entering into Jerusalem. And in that, that moment, they would have wanted what he has. Far too long had they wandered aimlessly and traveled meaning, meaninglessly through life. Now they see what it was that they sought in a man on a donkey. And they are caught unaware. And in an instant, they are changed. They drop their bags, their few possessions, and they follow Jesus. The poor also tagged along that day as well. They tagged alongside wherever the Lord went. At the parade, it was the penniless who sang out. They sang out Hosanna louder than any other. And why not? right? Because Jesus had given them the one thing that the world would never grant them. See, Jesus had given the poor hope. Hope of a better day today, studded with forgiveness and grace and mercy. The hope of a, of a brighter tomorrow. The hope of an eternity where the streets will be paved of gold, where a mansion would be waiting for them. 
There's a line in a movie that says, hope is a good thing. Maybe even the the best thing. That's what the poor of Jesus' day felt. They'd been outcast by society, downtrodden by the wealthy, and despised by the ruling class. But because of Jesus, they had hope in a new day, a new beginning, a new start, a new life. So when Jesus comes entering into the city riding on a donkey, a donkey, right? A symbol of the lower class, a symbol of the outcast, of the downtrodden, of the forgotten. They saw Jesus and knew. He identified with them. It was the poor in the crowd that would have most likely been the ones blanketing the road with their robes and their coats to honor his gift of hope to them. Even though they were the ones that had the least to spare. See, they realized that they couldn't save themselves on their own merit. In lowering their worn and tattered cloaks to the ground, they, they humbled themselves, becoming poor in spirit to reap the rewards of heavenly merit. They declared themselves spiritually bankrupt. Their pockets, they're empty. Their options were few. And in that moment, they stopped demanding justice and simply begged for mercy. And it was only then, it was then that they could have the hope of salvation. On the road to Jerusalem that day, they were given hope and life and promises of riches in heaven. Now the the political were there too that day. They were present. The zealots, right? We read about them in the Bible. The zealots were there and they were incited. See, the Romans were always a little bit worried around Passover. Passover was kind of a powder keg in Jerusalem. You had all kinds of elements coming in. You had lots of people. There was a history at the time of Passover of false messiahs coming, trying to stir things up, raise up an army. And the zealots were ready. Despicable Romans, right? They despised the arrogance of the ruling Roman government. They hated their pagan practices and their their false beliefs and their false gods and goddesses and the debauchery that came with it. And and, and they would have had a a rage burning inside of them. And they they were ready for battle. The zealots carried a a, a razor-like dagger in their belts. They were always ready. If If it was called and it was time to go, they were ready to fight the Roman oppressors. It was not uncommon for them to take out Roman soldiers and guards from time to time just to kind of flex their zealous muscles. They were the original guerrilla terrorists. Now the zealots, they see Jesus coming in and they see in Jesus the fulfillment of their desire to be free from tyranny. They saw Jesus as a liberator whom they believed would lead them in a fight for freedom against the Romans who occupied their land, who had been dominating the nation of Israel. They thought Jesus was coming to be their conquering king, to become the ruling monarch, right? And so they welcomed Jesus with palm fronds which was an open invitation for him to come and restore Israel to its rightful place. They were all ready to do battle. And with a single word, Jesus could have commanded an army if he wanted it. And they would have fought to the death against the much-hated Romans. And what bothered the political component of the crowd that day was the fact Jesus was riding on a donkey. Right? What sort of conquering king comes riding on a lowly, undersized donkey? Whoever came to conquer the world on a Ford Pinto. Right? That's the equivalent of what Jesus rode into town. 
Geo Metro, a Yugo, right? A Ford Pinto. Jesus was riding a donkey. He wasn't riding a war stallion as a king would come into town. A beautifully groomed animal, muscled with wonderful tack. He comes in riding on a donkey, a symbol of peace. Jesus was offering peace and they wanted war. These folks wanted revolution, not redemption. They desired deliverance from the hated Romans, not freedom from their sin. But the orders never came that day. Instead, they would have come to the realization that their destructive ways had not prompted the the desired change that they wanted. So in an instant, these would have been the people who would have taken those knives and discarded them, left them behind as they joined in the procession following Jesus. They were ready to fight, but no longer a war of hatred and violence, but now a battle of love and for peace. Another group that would have been present in the crowds that day would have been the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees, they were the ones standing kind of towards the back, right? They were the guys that had their arms folded, kind of that sarcastic snarl on their face, right? That ever watchful eye on Jesus, glaring at Jesus. Here comes Jesus again. See, they were narrow minded. They were prejudiced. They were intolerant religious people with their noses stuck up a little bit in the air, right? They were better than everybody else. Hmm. You've seen those people. Now Jesus, by and large, throughout his ministry, for the most part, Jesus generally tried to avoid avoid large, large crowds. They certainly gathered and he certainly taught them. But more often than not, his teachings came in small groups. See, more often than not, Jesus refused to take the dominant power oriented stance of other contemporary leaders. But on this day, he put on the symbols of the Old Testament put on the things that were reflected in the prophecies. And he declared by doing so in no uncertain terms, by his posture and bearing, he was saying to all who saw him, I am the king. He even picked the day. It was the day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, a day celebrated by the Jews, as the day to remember being freed from Egypt. And it also marked the beginning of the wheat harvest. Big deal and a big day that Jesus picked. But the only problem was he didn't pick this day to gain the adulation of the crowds, but he had picked this day to force the issue of his whole reason for coming to earth. His triumphant entry into Jerusalem literally sealed his doom. It was a a catalytic event that aroused the anger of of the religious establishment. It, It just frothed them into a frenzy of anger, setting the stage for the greatest event in all of human history. See, the Pharisees knew what Jesus was doing, and and that's why they had commanded Jesus, if you know your scriptures, they tell Jesus, hey, Jesus, tell your disciples to quit calling you a king. But Jesus, you can hear his voice piercing the air, saying, if I told them to stop, these rocks would cry out. Can you imagine the rocks, maybe the size of a baseball, right? Perfect size for throwing at somebody. The stones that these Pharisees had used on people who didn't keep the law, rocks that they had 
and holding, waiting to use. But they just didn't have the guts. The rocks that they loved to hurl at anyone that they could find fault in. You know any rock throwers? You know any rock throwers? Those, those people who, who, who love to find mistakes and faults in other people's lives. They're the first to complain, the first to criticize, the first to condemn. They nitpick. Uh, they point out a little mistake. They second guess all the decisions. They, they find the cloud in every silver lining. Rock throwing critics like the Pharisees gain power through criticism. And they love to snuff out other people's dreams by blowing down their aspirations. And along the road that day, there were some stones. I imagine some of those stones were ones that some of these Pharisees would have dropped when they saw why Jesus was coming. Rocks that would have hit with a thud to the street instead of to a person. Stones not thrown at Jesus, though they had been brought to the parade for that very purpose. They dropped their stones to follow Jesus. And the stones cry out of the power of Christ to change lives. Now dotted, interspersed throughout the crowd that day, also were people who were very passionate about Jesus because of what he had done for them personally. And for good reason they cheered, right? And screamed praises. I mean, imagine on one side is Bartimaeus, the, the blind man that Jesus had healed, right? Just a week ago in Jericho. Only 20 miles down the road. He had no need of the dirty gauze patches that he used to keep over his eyes because he could see. And a little further down the road up ahead, maybe, maybe there was the man who had sat by the pool waiting for Jesus to come heal his lameness. Waiting for an angel. He sat by the pool waiting for an angel to come heal him. But Jesus comes and Jesus touches him. And, and the wonder of his working power in his body makes the formerly lame man able to stand no longer needing crutches or no longer needing somebody to carry him along. He's able to get up and run off and rejoice. And maybe over there was that man who had that, that withered hand that didn't work, Right? It hadn't worked for so long. He'd, he'd learned how to work around it. But then it comes Jesus and heals it and makes him whole. Can you imagine? Then over here, here was Lazarus. Remember him? Lazarus standing there seeing Jesus come. Lazarus with tears streaming down his face because he was dead and in the grave. And Jesus cried, Lazarus, come out. And they're standing next to him or maybe Martha and Mary, his sisters who had lost him. And now he's found. No wonder they wanted to dance and cry. No, no wonder they wanted to shout and sing and smile and laugh. The, the, the one who rides in on the donkey, that's my healer. That's, that's the miracle worker. See, their lives have been transformed forever and they cannot contain their joy and excitement any longer. Have you ever felt the healing touch of Jesus? You ever felt the life-changing power of the wonder-working Jesus? If you have, you know what Bartimaeus felt. You know what the crippled man, the blind man, the lame man, the dead man felt. And if you have, by entrusting your life into Jesus, then through that we've, re we've received eternal life. And we know what Lazarus has felt. 
Because spiritually, we were all dead. But now we can be alive. So hurry. The parade is coming, right? You and I have a chance to be part of this parade. We have a chance to see He who overcame sin and death. We have a chance to see He who can heal the broken. He who can restore the sight to the blind and raise the dead. You see, the church is this continuing procession of this parade. The parade that started outside of Jerusalem 2,000 years ago continues marching throughout history in the form of the church. You and I are, are part of that parade if we choose to be. We can get to meet Jesus each and every week. In fact, He's here and present now. So what did you bring to the parade? Did you bring a cloak you're going to throw down for Jesus? Are you going to cut down some palm branches? Are you going to, maybe you were here bringing some rocks today to throw at Jesus. You see, Jesus wants your crutches. He wants your bandages. He wants your patches. He wants your pain. He wants your joy. He wants all of it. And he'll take all of that brokenness of your life and mend it back together again if you are so willing. See, Jesus can take the trash of your sin and make you clean and pure again. He can take your spiritual poverty and make you eternally rich. He can take your dead and lifeless soul and give you a resurrected and new one. See, Jesus is the hope of the world. And he is the hope of our lives. So what will you give Jesus today? What will you give Jesus as he comes passing by? When he looks your way, will you look him in the eye? Will you take him by the hand? Will you make him your king and your Lord forever? We are part of the parade. Let's pray.